Facebook right now. Okay, I'll be checking. Welcome to the second day of the California Preservation Conference. We're going to be getting the webinar started in four minutes. In the meantime, you can watch the slides as they're going by. Uh, this weekend is our first Doors Open California tour weekend. So you can bring your friends and family to all the historic sites in California. We have 70 sites on our list. Uh, you can check our website for more information. That's californiapreservation.org. And we'll be starting in four minutes. Hello and welcome to the second day of the California Preservation Conference. This is a free lunchtime program and we'll be getting started in two minutes. In the meantime, you can enjoy our slides going by talking about our conference app and our weekend event, Doors Open California. So we'll be starting in two minutes.
Hello, this is Chris Madrid French with the California Preservation Foundation and welcome to the second day of the California Preservation Conference. This is our free lunchtime program and if you're catching us on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn or Twitch, you can actually post comments on those applications and John will convey those to our speakers. I'd like to just get started as soon as possible. Uh, you can use the chat window to communicate with us or your friends who might be in the room. You can post where you're calling in from. And then you can use the Q&A box if you're in the Zoom room. You can use the Q&A box or your applications chat function to let us know if you have any questions. So today I would love to introduce our colleague, Shane Watson. You can go ahead and turn on your audio and your video, Shane. And Shane is going to be talking today about the LGBT, she's going to be introducing, I'm asking her to, to turn on her uh, video. Um, anyway, so welcome, Shane. I can see you're coming in. Uh, I'm, Shane, I'm trying to turn on my video. It's saying I can't. Okay, we'll work on that. All right, there we go. Oh, okay. It's always a surprise here at California Preservation Foundation. Here she comes. Shane, it's good to see you. And Adrian popped in by accident. <laughs> okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you. Yes, Shane, take oh. it away. Oh, sorry. Uh, thank you so much, Christine and John and CPF for continuing to support us on the Lion Martin House uh, projects. And thank you to all of you who are joining us today and showing up for LGBTQ history. Happy Pride Month. Um, my name is Shane Watson. I'm an architectural historian based in the San Francisco Bay Area. As uh, some of you may know, I specialize in LGBTQ history in San Francisco. It's one of my great passions. Um, today, I'm here to talk about the work that Friends of Lion Martin House, uh, which I co-founded, did with uh, SciArc to document the Lion Martin House um, in Noe Valley in San Francisco. But quickly, I just wanted to give you a quick summary of why we think the house is important. And then I wanna say a few words about what we plan to do for the house in the future. Um, so Del Martin and Phyllis Lyon were a lesbian activist couple living in San Francisco in, uh, 19, in the 1950s when they decided to purchase the house at 651 Duncan Street in Noe Valley in 1955. And then that same year, they co-founded the Daughters of Belitis, which we understand to be the nation's first lesbian rights organization. And then decades of activism followed, essentially headquartered in this house, in the living room of this house, until Del Martin's death in 2008 and Phyllis Lyon's death in early 2020. So in the fall of 2020, working with the GLBT Historical Society and Supervisor Raphael Mandelman's office, we organized a coalition of community groups to form the Friends of Lion Martin House in an effort to landmark the house to prevent its likely demolition once we'd heard it had been sold following the death of Phyllis in, I believe it was April 2020. So it was through that process that we were really able to establish a, a sort of trusting partnership with the new property owner who has become very supportive of all of our efforts here. She um, and her husband gave us full access to the site last year for documentation, which allowed SciArc to complete this, this beautiful work that will be discussed today. So before I hand it off to Whitney at SciArc, I just wanna say that um, it is our mission at Friends of Lion Martin House to acquire the property either through a long-term lease or purchase agreement and then return it to use for San Francisco's LGBTQ community. And you can follow along with that progress at uh, Friends of Lion Martin Houses on Facebook and Instagram. And you can also send me an email or a message anywhere and I'll add you to our email list. We are a grassroots group and very happy to have volunteers and support. So today I have the great pleasure of introducing Whitney Peterson. Whitney is a program manager at the Bay Area nonprofit organization, SciArc, leading digital, uh, leading digital documentation projects focused on interpretation storytelling. Whitney holds a master's degree in anthropology and museum and heritage studies from the University of Denver. Prior to joining SciArc, she worked for the National Park Service in interpretation and cultural resources, working on projects ranging from exhibit development to oral histories, um, oral history interviews and collections. 
So Whitney, do you want to take it from here? Thank you so much, Shane. Um, and thank you all for being here today. I'm super excited to be here to share more about this project, which I had the opportunity to be involved in um, from beginning to end. So I'm going to spend about the next 30 minutes or so sharing more about this project and this collaboration um, that SciArc was part of, as well as share a short demo of this virtual guided tour experience that I encourage everyone to go and access after this presentation and explore on your own. Um, so a little bit more background on, on this collaboration, on this project, you know, this began with um, friends of Lion Martin House reaching out to us at SciArc about potentially doing digital documentation of the home, which had recently become a city historic landmark. And they were looking for ways to support that ongoing preservation of the site. So us at SciArc, we are, of course, very energized about this project. The history and the legacy of Del Martin and Phyllis Lyons' work really aligns with another ongoing program that we have at SciArc to um, document sites that are connected to this journey to equal rights. And of course, we're always looking for opportunities to amplify local histories right here in our backyard in the Bay Area. Um, so through this collaboration, we worked with the Friends of Lyon Martin House, as well as the GLBT Historical Society to document the home, um, to support that ongoing preservation but also utilize that digital documentation as a canvas for creating this virtual guided tour experience where um, public audiences can access the home and connect with the histories and stories um, of Dell and Phyllis. So through the documentation and through the creation of that virtual guided tour, we're able to provide that documentation for educational purposes and researchers um, and through the tour, allow access to that home, which is currently not accessible to the public. And hopefully also, you know, inspire future generations through the stories of Dell and Phyllis uh, and through their work in activism. So I wanted to share a little bit about SciArc and you know, who we are in our history. So we're a nonprofit organization based in the Bay Area in Oakland. We've been around about 20 years now. Um, so we began documenting cultural heritage sites back in 2003. Uh, and since that work began, we've documented over 200 cultural heritage sites around the world uh, in, in 40 different countries. So while our work really began, you know, in 2003, focused on the documentation of built heritage, say over the last decade, our work has also expanded to utilize that digital documentation to provide opportunities for people not only to connect with those tangible spaces and those tangible structures, but also allow people to connect with the people and the stories and the histories that are so much a part of what make these places significant today. Um, so through our digital documentation, we're seeking to amplify not only those places, but also those diverse stories to inspire uh, reflection and dialogue. And we do that through a number of different mediums. You know, the project that we're talking about today is uh, available both online and through mobile, um, but we also are involved in other projects that include you know, VR platforms. So this approach has really evolved um, through thinking about cultural heritage documentation as place-based work. So looking at these sites and these places um, and how they also encompass people and histories and stories and these landscapes and all of these other aspects that really make a place what it is um, today. So through this place-based perspective and approach, our hope is that we can create more equitable, equitable access to cultural heritage through documenting places that maybe historically would not have been documented, and also through amplifying new voices as part of that documentation process. So I think this Lion Martin House project is a perfect example of uh, where the significance of this place and structure is also really brought to life through the stories of Dell and Phyllis and their lives in this home. And, you know, I love this picture so much because I think it emulates so much of what I've learned through this project and how much of the power of this place really comes through um, through Dell and Phyllis's story and the joy and the life that they cultivated together. 
uh, in that home space. So for this Lion Martin House project and all of our projects, we um, go through every project through this ongoing consultation with our partners. Um, and in addition to the ongoing consultation, we also have our interpretive process as well as this process of digital documentation. So for the interpretive component of the work we do, we work with our partners and stakeholders to really create a scaffolding for the stories that are presented through these virtual experiences and identify those key messages that we wanna to communicate to our audience. And then we also, of course, have the, the documentation process where we work with our partners to identify what areas of a site or what structures we wanna to document to amplify those stories. And then we put together our capture plan um, to outline you know, how we actually go about that 3D digital documentation of, of that space. So for the Lion Martin House project, um, this interpretive process really began with you know, this collaborative work with Friends of Lion Martin House and the GLDT Historical Society, who you know, connected all of us with these experts and community members who are connected to this history um, and who are able to shed light on that legacy and history of Dell and Phyllis and their, their life. So to develop the interpretive framework for the virtual experience, which I, I will share here at the end, um, we did a series of brainstorming sessions you know, with friends of Lion Martin folks and stakeholders to identify those key messages and takeaways um, to understand like, the audience we wanted to reach and ultimately develop this main theme or what we call this big idea which ends up being you know, the framework for all of the content and stories that you're able to connect with through that virtual experience. And so as part of that process, we were able to speak with a number of people who are experts on this topic and who have you know, very personal connections to these stories as well. We were able to speak with historians, um, Susan Stryker, Marcia Gallo, Don Romsberg. We also were able to interview and talk with uh, Kendra Mon, who's the daughter of Dell and Phyllis, um, who also spent quite a bit of time in the home when they lived there. So through speaking with them about you know, these key messages that we wanted to communicate through the experience, we were able to develop this main big idea um, for that guided tour, which is that you know, Dell and Phyllis broke barriers for LGBTQ and underrepresented communities through building that lifelong partnership and transforming that private space of their humble home. So for people that we spoke with, you know, the home is significant to the story in that there wasn't necessarily this barrier between public and private life for Dell and Phyllis, but that their partnership was, you know, essentially living out what they were trying to make possible in the world for others. So we wanted to be able to communicate both that this place where they held meetings for the Daughters of Belitis, which is, was this first lesbian civil rights organization in the country, uh, we wanted to be able to communicate the impact of that, uh, but also how their daily life and that lifelong partnership contributed to their activism as well. So in addition to speaking with a number of these folks during that interpretive process and developing the story that we wanted to present, um, they also serve as narrators and guides through the virtual experience. So um, hopefully all of you will be able to check out this resource on your own and you will get to hear directly from them about you know, their insights and perspectives and memories connected to the um, life of Dell and Phyllis in the home. So something that we were really excited about as part of this project is that uh, both Dell and Phyllis actually spent a lot of time with historians and researchers uh, conducting interviews and oral histories. And so at the GLBT archives, there are a number of oral histories that we were able to utilize to bring the actual voices of Dell and Phyllis into that virtual experience. So not only will you get to hear from you know, experts and people who have personal memories, but you'll be lucky enough to hear their voices themselves um, sharing about the impact of their work and kind of reflecting on 
um, what that meant to them. So these are just a couple of examples of some highlights and stories that you can engage with through the virtual guided tour. Um, this first one talking about the Daughters of Miletus and how that was you know, really founded as creating this social space for people to feel like themselves um, and how that was fostered in their home. And this, this second piece kind of reflecting on their work about how their work is perhaps more evolutionary than revolutionary, but how those contribute to one another. So again, I encourage you all to, to take a look on your own because um, I definitely am not doing this justice compared to uh, hearing them speak about their work and their lives themselves. So the next part of the, this project was doing the actual documentation process. Um, so at SIRC, we utilize these four different methodologies or tools as part of that documentation process. So these include um, LIDAR or laser scanning, as well as photogrammetry, both terrestrial, like on the ground, as well as aerial photogrammetry using drone technology. Um, and then of course we do, we conducted the interviews with the traditional uh, video. So for the LIDAR and laser scanning, the way that that works is basically that the laser scanner emits this laser that bounces off of the surrounding surfaces in a space or in a room. Um, and through that, emitting that laser, you measures that distance of all of the surrounding visible surfaces. So through each scan and through the rotation of the device and each scan, um, we're able to get down to you know, millimeter accuracy in capturing the surrounding space and creating that 3D model of the structure. So in addition to the LIDAR and laser scanning, we also combine that with this method in photogrammetry, which is essentially you know, taking hundreds or thousands of photographs sometimes um, of every inch of the structure. So for the Lion Martin House project, you know, we photographed every inch of the home um, with about 60% overlap so that we could stitch together all of that photograph information to create the color and the texture that you see in the 3D model, um, as well as fill in some of the, that structural information as well. And so for that, we used um, basic tripods, but then also drone to capture some of those areas where it's you know, impossible for for a person with a tripod to get to. Um, so through all of that data collection, we were able to combine all that information to create the very highly accurate 3D model of the home. So we spent about five days out on site doing all of the data capture. Um, and through that process, we captured almost uh, yeah, 750 aerial photographs, so photographs taken from a drone, uh, just over 4,000 photographs on the ground throughout the interior and exterior of the house, and then combined all that photogrammetry and photo data with about 114 laser scans. So we went to 114 different locations on the outside of the home and inside the home to collect all of the, the laser scan data. And so the image that you see here in the bottom right, that is a point cloud, um, as well as the image above that is a point cloud without the color. So that is showing the data that you can collect just from the laser scanning alone. Um, and on, on one of those initial stages to creating the, the full 3D model, which um, you'll see next. So something else that was really exciting about this project is uh, we had all of these amazing resources at the GLVT archives for bringing this space to life. And as you'll see here in this video, you know, this is the 3D model of the space as it was just a second ago, where you know, a lot of the um, furniture and items have been removed from the home. And so we wanted to give people a sense of what this space might have been like when Dell and Phyllis were actually living there. And so we were able to do um, some research at the GLVT archives and document a number of the items um, that are in the archives there that were donated by their daughter, Kendra Mon, 
um, and create 3D versions of those items and put them in the 3D model of the house. So as you see here, this is uh, this what we call a vignette of what to give people a sense of what that space uh, would have looked like at the time. So we were even able to create a 3D model of this 3D sculpture that you see here on the left-hand side, the bottom left-hand side, um, and put that on the wall. That I think gives a sense of what this space really would have been like when, when they lived there and it was filled with, with all of their things um, and their items. So we're really excited to be able to incorporate that into the, this experience as well. So through combining you know, all of that, the interpretive process, that documentation process, creating that narrative and exploring those different stories that you can connect with through that experience, uh, we were able to produce this 3D guided tour experience um, utilizing this guided tour platform that we've developed. So you can access this 3D guided tour uh, through the web. Like if you have a computer on the internet, you can also access it from your cell phone. Um, it's pretty basic navigation. So there's 17 stops in total. Each stop has you know, an expert narrator or somebody who's sharing memories or Dell and Phyllis themselves um, sharing insight on their lives and work. And um, each of the, those points of interest are supported with additional imagery that supports the narrative um, and the story that's being told at each of these places. And so something that's different about this platform and this experience than other virtual tours that you might see is this is a full real 3D environment. So other, other guided tours you might see are using 360 panoramic images where you are placed in one location and can kind of just move your head and look around. But in this guided tour experience, if you choose to, you can actually move three, freely throughout that whole space since this is a, a fully realized 3D model. Um, so in addition to doing the more guided experience through the 3D guided tour, you can also just freely explore that space um, on your own, which is, is very exciting. Uh, you can also easily embed this experience if you're an educator um, or somebody else who wants to share this more widely. Uh, this is very easily embeddable on um, other websites as well. So I wanted to actually open up this tour here and give you all a preview of what you can experience if you go check this out on your own. So what you see here is the 3D guided tour platform. Um, and this is the final resulting 3D model that was created through that digital documentation process. So as I mentioned, there are 17 different stops that you can choose from down below on um, this user, user interface. Um, on the right hand side below here, if I press play, this is where you can connect with the different narrators and experts who are sharing their insights um, and perspectives about the home and um, Dell and Phyllis. Uh, so what we tried to do with the, this experience is really encapsulate the story that we identified in that big idea. So you'll, you'll hear from a number of folks about the broader impacts that Dell and Phyllis had through their activism um, and what that has meant to people, but also through the experience you'll hear uh, these kind of maybe smaller stories, but just as profound about maybe what daily life was like for them at the home, um, what they did every day in that space to give a sense of what that, that lifelong partnership meant to them um, in, in this space. So here at the, this first stop, we have an introduction from historian Don Romsberg, who's introducing the significance of Dell and Phyllis in their home. And then automatically you move to a number of different uh, points of interest or stops where you can hear from different narrators. For example, here Kendra Mon is her daughter who's talking about you know, their impetus for, for buying the home. So I'm just gonna kind of uh, move through here to give you a little taste of 
of the different stories that you can experience and different perspectives on the home uh, that you can explore. Go into the home here. You see here that this is the 3D model that we created from what currently exists um, in the space today. And so something that is really significant to the story of this home and that Marcia Gallo talks about here um, during her narration is this picture window, which was part of the reason that they actually purchased the home. And you can see there's an amazing view of San Francisco and the Bay Area. Um, but something they realized in their activism is that having this, this beautiful picture window open to the street was perhaps a barrier for women who wanted to come here and um, be part of this, this community that they could not necessarily publicly be part of outside of the space. And so I encourage everyone to come and listen to this story of the window and the curtains that they put, they put up. Um, to help make that, that space feel safer for the women who are gathering here, but also the story of when they actually took the curtains down and what a happy moment that was for, for everyone. So here you can see the 3D recreation that we've created in this space to give you all a sense of what this would have been like when it was filled with all of their things. You know, when we talked to Kendra Mon and other folks who had been to the home when they lived here, they all talked about how this was just filled with pictures and letters and books and, um, you know, their life was so visible in every aspect of what was in this, this home. So um, we were able to utilize those actual items and recreate the space. We've also included this audio here um, from some stories we heard about the music that they like to listen to recreate what this might have been like with a bunch of people here, which was an often occurrence, according to you know, the people we spoke to about uh, their life in the home. The den area would have been where they would have perhaps written an, a lot of their work. It was also where the telephone was located, which you know, talking to Kendra, their daughter, and a number of other folks, you know, they were really a lifeline for so many people who didn't have somebody to talk to about their experience. And um, their Rolodex, one copy of that I think is in the Smithsonian now, um, but is there's also a copy of the GLBB Historical Archives that you can see is just extensive with um, the people that they were connected with, you know, not only in local communities, but also politically with the broader work and activism that they did. Um, and so this space, I think, really speaks to the work that they did that perhaps started in the home, but really reached uh, far, far beyond, you know, the, the walls of, of the space as well. I wanted to touch on one last space in the home here, which is the kitchen. This is an example of where you can hear more about kind of the everyday lives of their, their daily routine um, and the life that Del and Phyllis cultivated together in the space. As you can see with this image, they were avid um, cat lovers, um, which would roam around in the home um, and outside as well. And you can see evidence in the documentation with some, I believe, cat prints that are out on in the concrete and the front steps as well. So those little bits that you can see within the structure itself, I think really just bring to life the story of, of the life that they led here in the space. And then one last story I just wanted to touch on is um, here you can see outside that the stair lift was installed in the home. And I think that really connects to the story um, of them being able to live in this home late in life. You know, Phyllis was able to remain here through this group of caretakers, part of LGBTQ communities who came together um, and cared for her through, through late in life. Um, so I encourage you all to, to listen to that story um, as well, in addition to the, the other histories and um, perspectives that you can explore in the guided tour. 
Um, so hopefully that gives you all some insight into you know, this collaboration and this project that I've been so grateful to be part of um, and hopefully encourages you all to uh, take a look and explore this experience and, and learn about Dell and Phyllis on your own. So I wanna uh, leave some time here for uh, questions. I think perhaps I don't know if we have any in the chat here, Shannon. We do. Let's see here. So um, Molly Steiner asks, were you able to incorporate the rickety staircase they needed to navigate along with the chair to go up the side to their home? This was quite challenging as Phyllis aged in the home. You've mentioned that, but do you want to say anything else about that? Yeah, I think we were able to document all of the whole exterior of, of the home and yeah, that chair lift and the staircase and the documentation that you see in the guided tour experience, you know, there are some limitations with the platform and making it accessible online um, that that resolution is lowered a little, but you have a couple of options for um, making that resolution better. And so in addition to just like hearing those stories, you can you can get a lot of more detail if you go to the high resolution model in that that guided experience and explore the rickety staircase <laughs> further as well. So one thing I just wanted to say to Whitney um, and everyone else is that one of the reasons Friends of Lion Martin House wanted to see this property documented so thoroughly is um, and Whitney touched on this a bit, is it, but is to provide accessibility to what is a you know essentially private property, um, which is you know inaccessible to the public at this point and probably will be for the future, which we can talk about. But it's also, um, as you can see in the documentation, it's physically inaccessible. It's up several flights of stairs, and there's limited parking. So it it re we really wanted to give you know the world access to this property that wouldn't otherwise be accessible through this work. And then the other thing I wanna quickly say is the reality is there is going to be a four story house built on the parse, you know, it's it's a double lot, the Lion Martin house. It's, a, it's 649 to 651 Duncan. And the actual landmark is only 651 Duncan. So part of the process of, of agreement with the new property owner was to come to some sort of agreement on her, the pro, uh, project she wants to build on that adjacent parcel. So we are supporting a four story house on that adjacent parcel, which means we would lose half of the landscape as well as you know a lot of the view coming out of the house, but we were able to save the house in doing so. So I just wanted to say that. Um, and then there's another question here from Christine. Are there any plans to restore the property and house to turn it into a museum? We, Friends of Light and Martin House has started hosting community workshops and stakeholder uh, meetings to talk about future plans of the house and actually what's realistic in terms of, um, you know, what I said before about accessibility. Uh, I think we all agreed that this, that we would like to see this house purchased either through a long-term lease agreement or, or a lease through a long-term agreement or purchased from the property owner. She's very inclined to sell it to us. So our next step would be uh, a lot of fundraising. And we have just, we're about to sign a contract with this group called Community Vision Capital and Consulting. And they, through a grant from the, um, I believe they have some money from the Hewlett Foundation, they, have, are they are going to support us in coming up with a plan for the future of the property, which entails, um, uh, let's see, they're gonna help us compile existing organizational and stakeholder feedback to assist in drafting, drafting a plan, a, a potential business and operating plan for the house, as well as um, develop a preliminary project development budget and develop conceptual operating budgets, projections, blah, blah, blah. So this is kind of an incredible opportunity that's just unfolding and hot off the press, but the, our, what we do want to say is there a lot of work does need to be done on the house. The, the bones are essentially great. There's a little bit of water infiltration um, through the roof, but besides that, it's, uh, you know, we just need to figure out how much gonna, it's going to cost to, to just get it back into working order. And I think, again, what we've sort of narrowed down is this idea of a, a short-term 
allowing the house to provide some sort of short-term residency for perhaps a fellow at the GLBT Historical Society who would be doing research in the Lion Martin paper collection at the Historical Society. Um, there's you know, short-term housing for those types of research or research fellowships in San Francisco. It's, it's non-existent or it's very expensive. So it makes those types of fellowships infeasible. So that's just one of our ideas. Um, lots more to come. And again, feel free to reach out and volunteer. So let's see, any other questions for Whitney? Um, I have a question for you, Whitney. Yes. So why did you, what, was, what, what made you decide not to document the bedroom or feature that in the tour? Was that like a privacy concern? Yeah, I think we wanted to focus on areas where based on our like initial conversations with people, people really had like stories to tell. Um, so we wanted to um, make sure that each point of interest, you know, was contributing to that big idea and that major theme of, um, you know, telling that history and sharing about their legacy. And so we didn't really come across any stories, you know, connected to the bedroom um to include in the experience but that that definitely does not mean there's not more to explore i think kind of our approach here was to get people excited and interested about this history and about this place and you know it definitely is not a comprehensive history of um, del and phyllis or the house itself but um, hopefully just to spark people's excitement and um, i'm sure i'm sure there are stories to tell um, about you know each room and each each piece of that that very unique house. Um, so that's kind of how we landed on which points of interest that we decided to highlight. Okay, I have another follow up question. I have a follow -up question from Adrian Scott Fine. Mm -hmm. um, he says, "Great project and storytelling documentation effort, providing access and understanding of why a place like this matters." How do we do this for other culturally significant places in terms of cost and ease for others to do? Yeah, I think that's a really great question. Um, we are always looking for new opportunities um, to document you know, different cultural heritage sites. For, for us, you know, these projects come about in different ways. Sometimes, you know, I guess we've been around for 20 years, so sometimes we already have relationships with uh, cultural entities or with folks who are managing different sites. Um, and we work with those existing relationships, but actually like a lot of our projects come through our info email of people reaching out and telling us, you know, I have this, this amazing story and this amazing place that I would love to highlight. Um, and so, you know, sometimes that comes with funding to do it. Sometimes we have to explore funding opportunities on our own. But um, I think the more that we can highlight uh, different cultural heritage sites through this kind of digital documentation and be able to provide access, you know, we, we are very excited about that work. And um, if you have suggestions on, on places you'd like to see documented, we'd love to hear about them. Whitney, have you thought about doing anything to get this documentation into California's uh, K through 12 curriculum? Yeah, and that's actually a next step in this process is we're gonna be um, working with experts in the K through 12, K through 12 um, curriculum development world to develop lesson plans that will support this virtual guided tour. So um, with all of the other sites that we've documented as part of this Journey to Equal Rights program that you can access on our website, there are existing lesson plans that teachers K through 12 can implement in the classroom. And so um, we're hoping within you know, the next three to six months here to also have lesson plans for this experience that teachers can utilize and implement in their teaching in the classroom as well. Are there any features of this complex documentation uh, online for accessibility in terms of being ADA compliant? Yeah, so right now we we have captions to support you know partial accessibility, but that is also um, a, a very significant point or step in this process that we would like to make uh, this virtual guided tour and our website and all components of 
the virtual experience more accessible. So um, stay tuned and we will, we will um, have more updates on that for sure within the next year here. Okay, I'm not seeing any more questions. John, are you seeing anything on the other channels? Let's see here. I, okay, so Stephanie asked, I think we sort of addressed this, but now that this documentation has been done of the private property, if it weren't your intent to preserve the property to return it to its original use, if that weren't your intention, what purpose would the designation serve now that the house has been fully documented? So again, like I said before, follow along friends of my Martin house, we're hoping to not return it, well, sort of return it to its original use. Um, in the sense that we want it to be con continue to be housing. Um, and I also wanna mention that it's, we talked a lot about the idea of this becoming a museum where it is publicly accessible. And I just think that in this neighborhood with the limited parking on this street and the fact that it is a 100% residential neighborhood, it would be really difficult to open it up to the public. here oh i have a question too um so uh yesterday we had a session on augmented reality and um uh, you know there's 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 an amazing horizon of possibilities in sight interpretation um looking ahead and i asked the panelists yesterday what she thought um was sort of the most exciting next step for this kind of technology and how it can help both interpret uh, and tell the stories and and also protect historic sites and i'm wondering where you think you know where you think this technology can best be harnessed and what what exciting new developments in this technology could could take preservation a step further I think there's so many different avenues, I think, on the horizon with digital documentation. And, um, you know, my background is in kind of the storytelling and interpretation component of this. And I just see um, so much value in being able to utilize this digital documentation to enhance that storytelling. So, for example, if, if you go to a site in person today, you know, you, maybe you can catch a tour, um, like with a guide on site. Um, but you might not be able to, you know, get a tour, for example, or hear the voices of like Dell and Phyllis, for example, you know, bringing a lot of diverse voices into the conversation, I think is something that um, can be a really powerful part about utilizing these digital platforms um, to, you know, highlight those stories um, that you might not be able to engage with in person. And of course, it it doesn't replicate the on-site experience of being at these places, but I think there are just so many opportunities to, like, like that example, you know, bringing in these these voices um, to connect with those histories um, in this kind of immersive space that I'm really excited to see more of, and I think is a really powerful step forward. So, Whitney, just to follow up on that. Uh, did the, uh, Ellis Martin asks, did the queer legacy of this space affect the capture documentation methods of this project? Thinking about the at times interpretive elements involved in imaging, such as camera placement, lighting, et cetera, paired with a number of brilliant stakeholders and historians involved. Yeah, I think our goal, you know, how we go about this process is to understand the story and perspectives of people who are connected to these places and you know what aspects of this site are important to the story and might we wanna highlight in that interpretive component. And so that's definitely um, a part of that process. I think for, for this site, we had the opportunity in that it is a, it's a very small home. I don't know if you get the sense of that um, going through the virtual experience, but we were able to capture, you know, so many little nooks and crannies and spaces within that area. But that is definitely, you know, part of that interpretive process was understanding, uh, yeah, what are the significant points to highlight from people, from the perspective of people who have connections to this history um, and this community. 
Um, so I, I do think that is a very important part of the process. So Whitney, uh, another question. There seems to be an emphasis on touring interiors or structures in general. Is there any interest in using this technology to perhaps document routes of travel or daily activity of notable individuals? Yeah, I think thinking about um, cultural heritage on this broader sense in terms of landscape is something that we've been thinking about a lot as well. Um, I don't know of necessarily like movement or routes, but we we are involved in this project right now, documenting the Inca Road um, through three different cultural heritage sites. Um, and so working with local partners at those places to highlight the stories of these different stops that are significant um, through both Peru and Ecuador. And so that's an example of where you can take these more localized heritage sites and through bringing those stories together in a virtual online platform, you know, communicate and, and tell that story of this broader landscape. Um, so we we're working on a number of projects um, similar to that, you know, related to more indigenous cultural heritage in the United States as well, more on this landscape scale. Um, so yeah, very excited to explore um, how we kind of expand how we define cultural heritage. So the house, someone asked how many square feet it is. I think it's 756 square feet and it's one bedroom, one bath. Uh, once you go up the stairs, enter the house, you're in the living room, you go up another set of stairs and it's the den and the bathroom and the bedroom. And then it's really just the kitchen and the little sitting area and that's it. Mm -hmm. So, Let's see, uh, Stephanie asked a follow-up question. If it remains a private house with this documentation, would you still advocate for the property to be designated? So it is a San Francisco landmark, which means it's protected under CEQA in terms of potential demolition or substantive alterations to the exterior. We, um, we are pursuing having it designated as a National Historic Landmark, um, working with the property owner right now on that. Um, she's generally supportive. We would pursue that only because I think, so I believe there's a National Park Service grant we're going to pursue. I think it's called the History of Equal Rights Grant. And I, I'm not sure, but I believe you might have to have a National Register designation to be eligible for that grant. Um, so we do want to open ourselves up to as many funding possibilities as possible. So if someone knows anything about that, feel free to reach out. Um, Otherwise, I don't think we would go through the steps required to pursue designation. It just doesn't seem like we would we would want to spend our money on that unless we really had to. So let's see here. Kathleen Rhodes says, what suggestions would you have for other grassroots LGBT groups hoping to preserve the history in their own, history in their own areas in similar ways? Whitney, do you want to take that one? Yeah, um, you, you mean like through digital documentation, I think um, you can always reach out to us <laughs> at SciArc at, um, through our info email. Um, you know, we're always looking to, to document um, those histories, especially here, you know, in the Bay Area. Um, I think these technologies are becoming more easily accessible. Um, so there are, you know, our, our approach and methodology is, is quite extensive to get like highly detailed, um, accurate information. But um, if you, there are tools out there, um, like even on your cell phone, you know, you can use um, that as a, a laser scanning tool to some degree. Um, but uh, yeah, if, you, if you're interested and you have specific heritage sites you're interested in documenting, you know, please reach out and we would love um, to hear about it. And I, I can also say that um, people might not know about the National Park Service's LGBTQ theme study called LGBTQ America, which was published in 2016, I believe. And that has several chapters providing guidance on how local people in local communities can, can do these sorts of grassroots preservation projects, including guidance on how to write a historic context statement for a city, which is sort of a foundational 
tool for starting to think about preserving these, these types of properties. And there's also a really wonderful nationwide organization called the Rainbow Heritage Network, which is an affiliate group of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And the Rainbow Heritage Network is predominantly on Facebook, but it's a great group of, I think a couple thousand people who are is as enthusiastic as we are about LGBTQ history in the United States and, and how to preserve it. So let's see, we have an anonymous attendee asks, in hindsight, what might we have done to preserve the site before Phyllis died? In other words, could we have raised the funds to preserve this home instead of now working with a new owner to patch together a plan to preserve the property? So this is kind of a tricky situation because it was the goal of Phyllis, Phyllis and her caretakers and, and, and the people who support her and her community to allow her to live in the house until she died. And so she was there for quite a long time. I believe she developed Alzheimer's, dementia, and had a 24-hour care team. So it was extraordinarily expensive. And I believe the daughter of Dell and Phyllis had to take out loans to pay for all of this. And so they needed to sell the house to pay back a lot of that, those loans. And so we really do support the fact that we couldn't have done much prior to Phyllis's death just because she was there and living there, which you know is what we would all want, we think. Um, let's see, I think that might be our last question. Amy Kirby? Did you have a question? Okay. I, I think that's it. I, I did give Amy the ability to unmute herself if she'd like. Sorry um, about that. I didn't realize I could hit that. I'm sorry. Oh, not a worry. So you you did not have a question? No, I did not. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, great. Um, I just wanted to be sure uh, if somebody was raising their hands that they had an opportunity to ask. Um, I, I just wanted to thank both of you for your time today. It's it just a, it's a fascinating project. And um, we thought that your partnership, your collaboration with so many different local organizations and working together to come to sort of a solution to interpret the site. Um, and it resulted in such an, amaz an amazing end result, you know, and um, I think everybody should visit the, uh, the virtual tour and sort of browse around because I was listening to some of these oral histories and they're just fascinating to hear. So thank you both for your hard work on this project and for your hard work protecting the, the legacy of the site. Um, with that being said, I'm going to uh, paste something into the chat box here and um, let everybody know you can leave feedback on this session uh, at uh, that link. And then also join us for some other Doors Open California programs in San Francisco, including a, a tour of the um, GLBT Historical Society archives. It's open all day, thanks to Andrew Schaefer there. He's um, and, and a sponsor, a generous sponsor. Um, and then also to uh, check out the Leather District tour in San Francisco. Um, that was that'll be uh, led by Gail Rubin, a leather historian, and uh, plenty of other sites. We have 75 other sites across the state. So we hope you'll check out the website and join us for those programs. Uh, any final words for our panelists? Thank you so much, John and CPF for supporting us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, this is great to be a part of this and I'm so excited to hopefully get others excited about visiting this virtual tour and about uh, preserving the site. Okay, well, we'll see everybody at the next session and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Happy Pride. Happy Pride.